for healing and the ways we have sinned against God, against one another, and ourselves. He refers to it quietly and silently. Heavenly Father, hear the confession of our sins as we come in the name of Jesus. Father, you sent your Son to be the Savior of all nations. I confess before you and my Jesus that I have not been faithful in my commitment to live under the Lordship of my new Lord King. I have not unconditionally loved and accepted others as you graciously loved and accept me. I Please be seated as we turn now to God's holy word. The first uh, lesson for this Epiphany Sunday is the prophecy concerning uh, those who would come to worship the Christ child. In the Old Testament book of the prophet Isaiah, the 60th chapter, we'll read this uh, prophetic word responsively as it's printed. Arise, shine, for your light has come. See, darkness covers the earth. But the Lord rises upon you. And his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light. And the kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on the Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will drop the soul of joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. Herds of camels will cover your land. And all from Sheba will come bearing gold and incense. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading is a letter, part of the letter of the Apostle St. Paul to the Ephesians. And as we think about the first non-Jews coming to worship Jesus, Paul also identifies the unique call that he had as an apostle to take Christ to the Gentiles and then emphasizes that that is also our call. It is through the church that God continues to share his love and life in Jesus with the nations in these words. Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation 
as I've already written briefly. In reading this, then, you'll be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise of Christ Jesus. I became servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. And although I'm less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. This is the word of the Lord. Let's rise for the gospel preparation verse. Epiphany Gospel from Matthew chapter 2, the record of the wise men visiting the infant Jesus. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's um, chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, make a careful search for the child, and as soon as you find him, report it to me, so that I too may go and worship him. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over that place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented to him gifts of gold and incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to, the, to, the, to their country by another route. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated as we join in singing the hymn of the day.
Grace is yours, mercy is yours, and peace is yours from God our Father and from our dear Lord and our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Our text is the um, gospel lesson today. And as I said at the the beginning, we're going to take a look at some of the reactions of the group. uh, That groups that gathered that first epiphany. Uh, and, and just think a little bit about how we respond, how those around us respond to uh, the celebration of Christmas, the birth of the King. And as we do that today, I'd like you to go back a, a week, and not that anybody's thinking about Packers, um, and realize that at every game there's all kinds of reactions, specifically three, that happen in almost any kind of uh, sports contest, and I'm sure there were well, there was plenty of this last weekend. The Lions fans, if you happen to be a Lion fan like my niece's husband, um, they were a little dejected, right? So they were a little disappointed, a little frustrated, a little dejected. The Packers fans, on the other hand, were a little excited and exuberant. And, and if you've ever been to a sporting event, you know there's always those Besides those who are dejected and those who are exuberant, there's those who just really don't care. So you might have been one of those who didn't even watch the game because you really don't care, right? So I'd like you to think a little bit about that in terms of uh, Christmas and Epiphany and about the reaction to the Christ child. Um, there's three sets of reactions. You have the reaction of Herod, the king. Uh, he wasn't very happy to hear that there's another king that was born. And we know the rest of the story. It wasn't in the gospel today, but it soon follows that uh, after he realized the wise men weren't coming back, he sent soldiers out to kill anybody who was uh, up to the age of two, a boy in Bethlehem, hoping that he would eradicate the king that had been born. We would guess that he chose two years old because he had ascertained, as we heard in the gospel today, the time when the star would appear, had appeared, and calculated that would figure, well, that's about how old the child <laughs> might be. Um, he was a bit hostile. And if you know anything about Gary, you know that um, this was in his character because he ended up killing a couple of his wives, a couple of his kids, because he thought that they were after his throne. So that he would do something like this is not a character for here. He's hostile. In the middle, we've got uh, the chief priests and the scribes. Now, somebody comes and asks you, because you've seen this group come in from the east, and says, where's the Christ child going to be born? You would think it would pique their curiosity. And, and they give the right answer. He's going to be born in Bethlehem based on the prophecy from Micah. The Jew Bethlehem, Bethlehem, he will come from uh, come a ruler, he will shepherd nine people in Israel. He hears that promise, uh, and, and they know the, the words, at least in their head, but it doesn't lead them to do anything. There's no change of, of heart. And, and you would think that these people who were waiting for the Messiah and who had somebody who said maybe he's been born in the city of David, that these people would have maybe beat the wise men to Bethlehem to see what they could see, to find out what they could find out. But as far as we know, from the biblical record, from any extra biblical records, they never found out at all. They just gave to Herod the information. And then there's the wise men who... Uh, don't look particularly exuberant in this passage, or this picture, but you and I know that they express their exuberance not so much with what's on their faces, but what what their uh, feet did, what their hands did, what their hearts did, and they brought to Jesus, it tells us, gold and frankincense and myrrh, which was, we know, probably a very timely gift, seeing as how um, uh, shortly thereafter an angel shows up and says, you guys got to get out of here. And, uh, and, and Joseph has to travel to Egypt. Well, where did they get the money for that? These were poor people. Well, I'm sure that the gold, incense, and her, that the uh, ice men bought became part of what gave them the capacity to be able to pack up and move and live in a foreign country for a little while. God provided in 
in a timely fashion for his son. But today I'd like you to think about these uh, responses to epiphany. What's your epiphany? Is it a hostile response? Is it a indifferent response? Or is it an enthusiastic response? Because we see all three in the gospel of that first epiphany. First, there's the hostile response. And we still have for hostile responses today. These are uh, two uh, promos uh, by the uh, organization atheist.org. And uh, what they say is, of course, that uh, we don't need Christ during uh, the Christmas holiday. Nobody needs Jesus. Because the essence of, of, uh, of Christmas, which they call Xmas here, are things like hot chocolate and friends and the rockets and music and lights and fun and charity. And I love Chinese food. I said I don't know why they put Chinese food up there. But um, somebody reminded me on the way out, they're usually the only restaurants open on Christmas Day, right? So that's why Chinese food has become a tradition for some people on Christmas. But, but there are people still in our world who are hostile to the message of the Christ, the King, being born. And I would suggest one of the reasons that that happens is because nobody likes to give the kingship, the lordship of their lives to somebody else. I like being my own boss. I like being in charge. I don't like it when other people tell me what to do, where to go, how to behave. I, I like it when I'm the king and lord of my life. And for somebody else to claim that place, for somebody else to say they have a right to that space, might make me a little hostile. And when you and I rebel against the word of our God and our individual lives and decide to go our, our own ways, uh, it's a reflection of that hostile response. And yet you and I know what Jesus did in response to that hostile response. He was proclaimed king not only at his birth, but also on the cross when another Herod uh, um, and uh, Pontius Pilate made sure that, uh, that he was going to hang on a cross and, and Pontius Pilate put above his head these words, this is Jesus of Nazareth, king of the, of the Jews. And declared what the wise men said by their question to be true. In other words, the hostility that Jesus experienced both early and later in his life, God had transformed into a holy work. When Christ, the Son of God, the one who came to be our Savior, who would live the perfect life, died now an innocent death so that he could take your sins and my sins away, paying for them fully and completely, and claiming his place in your life and my life that he would be our king. On this epiphany, what's your response? Is it a hostile response or is it an indifferent response? Here we've got the chief priests and the teachers of the law who had all the right answers but did none of the right things. They knew in their head what the right answer was, but it never made that uh, 12 inches between the head and the heart to transform the way that they were going to live. And, and this is a real danger for us. We're reminded that when Jesus was in his ministry, he saved his harshest words for people like the chief priests, the Pharisees, and the teachers of the law. He saved his harshest words for those who had all the head knowledge, but had never made it to their heart and transformed the way that they lived, the way that they treated others. As I was thinking about that, I came across this story written by Chris uh, Hoyts, who's an international director of an organization called The Word Made Flesh. It's an organization that works especially among the poor of this world. And in his book, Simple Christianity, he gives this example. He says he was uh, uh, walking the streets of a place in India called Kolkata, not Calcutta, but Kolkata. And uh, it was a, it's a destitute region in, in southern uh, Asia. And he said he was walking with uh, companions, a fellow by the name of Josh, a gal by the name of Sarah, and his wife, whose name was Philemon. They 
stumbled across, uh, fell off as they were walking along who was lying on the ground under a filthy, fly-infested blanket. There was a three-foot trail of diarrhea that was making its way toward the gutter from him, and it was obvious to anybody who was passing by that this guy was very sick and probably either dead or dying. And this is what he writes in his account. He says, my pal Josh, he tapped the body on the shoulders to make the person was dead. But the body moved. So we pulled the blanket down from the face and uncovered the helpless face of what we thought was probably about a 22, 23 year old young man. He was visibly stunned by our approach. And as soon as we, he realized that we were there to help them, he began weeping uncontrollably. Well, as we bent down to help him, he said a crowd was gathering uh, around us, and he continued to cry. We didn't have much to work with, but we had some bottled water and found a newspaper, and uh, my friend Sarah began cleaning the young man, wiping the diarrhea with the newspaper and rinsing him off with the water. And then we asked his name, Tutala Das. He was lost, he was afraid, and he was alone. His body was a leathery skinned skeleton, and his bulging eyes accentuated the shape of his skull. He just kept crying. We tried to get a taxi, but none would stop for us. The crowd grew, but no one else stepped in to help. Two more friends uh, happened to be walking along the same street just then. They were able to find a taxi, and they took the Toledas uh, with them and they headed off to Mother Teresa's house for the dying. Felina, Sarah, Josh, and I stood there in disbelief. And then he said, I lifted my head during the process of helping him and, and caught sight of a church and a sign that was less than five feet away from where we found to tell the dots dying. The sign on the church gate said, all are welcome here. It may have been what inspired somebody to drop him off in front of a church, figuring somebody would help. But was he welcome? People from the church watched from inside the group gate, but the gate never opened, and not one of them came out. The Lord reminds us that we have a call to be his hands, his feet, his heart, and his eyes in this world. And he invites us to have a passion and care for what we see around us. He invites us to be his hands of, of love uh, in this world. And it is easy because of our busyness, because of the cost it might get us in terms of time or commitment to serve those who are in that kind of need. But Jesus reminds us that uh, we're not called when he's our king to be indifferent, but rather to enthusiastically embrace the calling that he's given us to love and to serve those who are around us. And that leads us to the third kind of response. It's an enthusiastic response. And sometimes people don't see a lot of enthusiasm in you and me. There's a study that's been done by uh, the Barnard Research Center over a, a, spirit, a period of a, a few decades from 1965 to 2002. And included our two statistics that, uh, that show how those outside the church often view us who are inside. Nearly 9 out of 10 outsiders, 87%, said that the term judgmental accurately describes present day Christianity. And of the non Christian sur survey, 84% said they personally knew at least one committed Christian. And yet, 15% thought that the lifestyles of those Christ followers was no different than anybody else that they knew. Is Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the King who was born in Bethlehem and who rules and reigns through the power of his cross and his resurrection, does he make a difference in your life? And it doesn't mean that we have to get up and, uh, and shift. And, and shout. But it does mean, it means uh, that we have a change of behavior and attitude. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Andrews from that interview four weeks ago, five weeks ago now. When they asked him, uh, you know, 
about the prospects of the Packers. And what do you say? Well, you just have to run the table. And we have the capacity to do it. It amazed me when I watched that interview that this was his face. It wasn't the, we're going to do it, guys. No, it wasn't that kind of thing. It was just a very calm, you know. But he had a confidence that, that they could. And then if they used the gifts they had that they would run the table. Do you and I have that confidence in the leader who was born that first Christmas, who was worshipped by the wise men, that we can be enthusiastic in our service and love for him? There was a recent TV commercial where a young man struggling with this uh, experience in his life. He is he is been pledged to a woman in an arranged marriage. In his own country, those kind of marriages are the norm, but he lived long enough in America that he wondered whether that was such a wise thing to do anymore. And he thought he might just suffer if he adhered to this ancient custom. Still, when she flew to the airport, uh, he dutifully showed up with uh, some flowers in hand and, and as they depict him, a gloomy expression on his face. But then when she walks through the terminal and he sees her, his expression changes. She was beautiful. And the thought of marrying this woman was no longer a dreadful duty. It was a, a joy and a delight. It was no longer burdensome or joyless, but it was an opportunity to love and serve. And, and the question that you and I are always asked at this time of year as we hear about this one is born being the Jews is that we really seen him for who he is with eyes of faith. What can change it for us? Sometimes, you know, it feels like we drag ourselves to church on a, on a really cold day. Sometimes we force ourselves to serve others, but our hearts are always in it. And then we're like that guy in the airport that we grudgingly, you know, stand there holding our flowers to God. We're trying to live holy lives because we know we should, but not necessarily because we want to. What changes that? Well, it's once again going to the manger and asking that question, where is he who's born to be the Jews? And seeing in the Christ child the God who is willing to set aside his godness and put on human flesh for you and for me. <coughs> it's seeing that one who's proclaimed Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, on the cross once again, standing at the foot of the cross, and knowing he went through because he loved us with an eternal and everlasting love. What changes our hearts is seeing Jesus for who he really is. And when we get a vision again and again of who he is, then we're energized to carry out the mission that he's given us to do, to be his lights in this world, to share his love and grace. Because, you see, once we grasp who he is and we celebrate what he's done for us, then serving is no longer a burden. It's a joy and a privilege and a delight. And he invites us once again to support him. Do not have a hostile response or an indifferent response, but an enthusiastic response as we move into an opportunity to serve family, friends, neighbors, and our world in this new year. Would you stand and let me pray? Father in heaven, we, we thank and praise you that you sent your one and only son into this world. We thank you that we have, in the last few weeks, had an opportunity to go to that manger once again. And in mind and heart, go to Bethlehem to find him who was born, not only king of the Jews, but king of the nations. And, and we just ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would allow us to, to live enthusiastically as we embrace again and again the love and grace that flows from his cross and in the tomb to us. Fill our hearts, Lord, with, uh, with a love and a joy in 
in serving and blessing others in the way that you have first blessed and served us in the name of Jesus. Amen. May that now that peace which affects all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in your Jesus and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed we confess. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, son of an unconscious Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We remember today the gifts of the Magi which they brought to honor the infant king, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Let's now bring to his altar the best that we can this day and every day. Let us pray. King Jesus, as the Magi offer gifts to you, receive the treasure of ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Strengthen us to share your world with the gifts you give until that day when we have completed our journey to the place of eternal life. Amen. We continue with our prayers this day, uh, the response of prayer as uh, it's printed. Heavenly Father, in the darkness of this world's spiritual night, you created a special star to guide the wise men to your Son. Let the light of your Son, Jesus, be in your church to serve the nations. Shine on us and your followers everywhere, that receiving your glory, we proclaim your name. Give us courage to boldly tell the good news of the world for the Shine your light and healing on those who struggle in sickness, especially Adam and Sherry, Barb and Alicia, Cheryl, Dick, Carol, Lucas, Penny, Randy, Tom, Pastor Peter, Charlotte Stitchin, Jennifer Lindsay, and Therese Sider. That the warmth of your healing presence will remind them that they are not alone. Extend your also, shining your light and strength on those who serve for us in other lands, including um, Stephen Christa Wiesenauer for um, Salam and Georgina Iagri in Ghana, 
and uh, Phil and Jamie Engel in Southwest Asia, for the Lutheran Church missions of Uganda, Congo, and Kazakhstan. We ask, Lord, that, uh, that as uh, they share your message and your love, you would give them peace to proclaim your grace. Shine your light and comfort on those who struggle and starve, especially the family of Corky Kreiser, that the warmth of your resurrection light shine hope and comfort into their hearts. Shine your light on our families, especially uh, uh, Amanda and Andy Parrott, uh, leading them as uh, yesterday they began their journey through life together in marriage. We also ask that, uh, along with Ed the Congresso, uh, we give thanks for uh, his daughter Sarah's graduation and ask for your blessing as she prepares to take her board certification test. We rejoice in the continuing strengthening of faith that you give to Ed and ask for wisdom and help as he deals with decreasing eyesight. We join Sue and Jean Lovenstein in thankfulness for good health, friends, and family. Bless especially one of Jean's co-workers as she battles uh, cancer and undergoes treatment. Keeping us strong in faith and commitment, along with Ben and Maggie Latagrasa, Fernando Lataya, and uh, Devin and Dania from the floor, we ask that you would uh, continue to lead us through this new year until you bring us to your eternal kingdom. Lord, these were the things we uh, commit uh, to you so that you might shine your light through them and also through us. May us now boast for your mission to make disciples of all nations. Into your hands, O loving Father, we commend ourselves and Paul for whom we pray. For we have confidence in your love. in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory,
true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins.
preserving you the true faith and the life everlasting, go from his table with his peace. Amen.